What are the advantages and disadvantages of blackened armour? Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorial. Now, the eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed that um, I'm selling my blackened armour, probably. Okay, so I've put my armour up for sale. No, I hear some people cry, because a lot of people out there really love my blackened armour. But an opportunity to get a new armour has come up, unexpectedly, and so I had to move fast. Now, for those of you who don't know, um, I am actually having another armour made, which is a long-term project, but getting armour made takes a long, long time. It's also quite expensive as well. So unfortunately, I can't keep all the armours, so to fund the new armour, which an opportunity has come up to get that's available now, I have to sell this armour. But that was something that I was probably planning to do in the future anyway. So it was a sort of easy decision for me because it was like, well, okay, I'll sell this now instead of in a year's time and that will enable to me to get this other armour and then I'll work out how to pay for the other armour uh, as we go along. Uh, but nevertheless, let's talk about darkened armour. So it's been notable to me over the years and in fact people have actually specifically asked me this question about blackened armour. First of all, they've asked how it's blackened. They've also asked me about different finishes on armour. We'll talk about that in a second. Although I have done a video not long ago about that topic, so I won't go deep into that. Um, but what are the advantages and disadvantages? Now, the first thing I want to say before I go into that, um, I'll try and keep this fairly concise, is that um, it wasn't my choice to have blackened armour. Okay, This armour, much like the one I'm looking at now, became available and I jumped on it. Would I have chosen to have black and armour from the start if I had been having this made for me? Probably not. Um, and that was because I'd heard about certain disadvantages of black and armour. One of those being that if you wanted to change pieces, uh, so mix and match, you wanted to, let's say, replace your pauldrons or, uh, you know, put a different salad with, with the um, harness, then it's very difficult to get the colours to match. And that is absolutely true. However, it's not as difficult as I thought it might be. Um, and that is because this is chemically blued. So we answer another question there. So this isn't heat blued. Now, traditionally, they did actually have ways of chemically bluing things. I don't, I honestly, hand on heart, I don't know whether they did, but there are certain fairly widely available chemicals that you can mix together to make steel go different colors. Now, for anyone who doesn't know, when steel changes colors, it is oxidization. So you might think of oxidization as rust, and that is one form of oxidization. But if you clean the rust off, you will notice that underneath you have what's called patina or patina, which is where the steel underneath the rust goes a dark color. And we often find that with uh, antique swords. I mean, if I just uh, grab um, an antique sword here, here's a good example. You'll notice when I show antiques on the channel, they often look dark. And the reason is it's a reaction between the steel and the, the air and a bit of moisture in the air as well. So fundamentally, oxidization changes the color of the metal, but it doesn't always change it the same color. Depending on the nature of the, the, uh, the air, the acidity of things like people touching it and things like this, it can go different colors. So without going deep into the science of it, because I don't know all the science of it, um, the fact is that you can turn steel a number of different colors, uh, including brown, um, black, um, blue, um, a goldy colour, all sorts of different colours as a result of different things that happen to it or things that you do to it. And another common way of doing that is with heat. So most people, if they want to make something blue, uh, steel blue, they'll just use a blowtorch. I mean, I've blued loads of things in my life. I've blued cross guards and pommels and all sorts of things. Um, and that is the colour also, I think it's about 400 degrees centigrade, that approximately is tempering heat. So when you've quenched something, so something's glowing red at eight, 900 degrees, and you quench it in oil, for example, it, it comes, out, comes out black, that's oxidization. You clean that off, it's now silver because you cleaned the oxide off the surface, and then you temper it to a blue heat and you keep it at a blue heat for a long time, and that tempers it and makes it springy, for example, if it's a spring steel. And you'll end up with something that's blue, but then that blue is normally polished off in the knife or sword making process or armor making process but you can leave it blue. But as I say, there's also chemical ways to achieve the same thing. So by heating, by acid and other chemical treatments, um, and just the air um, and natural ox oxidization, steel can change color. So to cut a long story short, armor can be made 
to be black straight from the forge. It can be blued as a result of heating up to blue heat or as a result of hardening and then tempering. Or it could be left with a goldy finish or even a purpley, um, purpley finish, purpley blue. All of these kind of gradient of colors, it's not quite a rainbow, but the gradient of colors that steel goes through, you can make steel that color. So armor that color. But in addition to that, you can also paint it. And salets, particularly in Germany, uh, and I think probably in Switzerland as well, were sometimes painted with uh, either the colors and the, the flag of the city or city state or the, the particular local lord or other heraldry painted onto them. So, and it can have a cloth cover as well. That's another one actually. So you can have, uh, you know, something like velvet, for example, or sometimes even leather uh, surface over, riveted usually, sometimes glued over the surface of armor as well. So the steel can be changed lots of different colors. It can be painted. It can be um, just blacked from the forge and just not, not polished up, not ground off. Or of course, it can be highly polished. Now, I did a review not that long ago about a recent book by Chris Dobson, where he asserts that armor was usually a color other than brightly polished, highly finished silver color that you're normally familiar with um, steel armor. I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. I don't think the evidence really supports it. But what I would say is there's a middle ground. I don't think he's wrong. I'm not saying that. I think that probably the majority of armor certainly in the 14th century, uh, late 14th century and into the 15th century was highly polished steel, most of it. We have it shown in art fairly convincingly and we also have it referred to in written references as well. Uh, but as we go into the later 15th century, we possibly maybe see an increase in the uh, sort of things like this, blackened and blued armors. And in the 16th century, we even have uh, it used as a decorative effect where you have black next to silver, uh, most famously in certain uh, German armors, uh, which maybe we'll do a dedicated video on in the future. So there we go. There's an overview of blackened armor. Uh, it wasn't uncommon in the 15th century. Certainly it was even more common in the 16th century. Um, there was a fair amount of it about, but don't think that all armor was colored. Don't think that all of it was blued or blacked or russeted or whatever or gilded in some cases. It, much of it was just highly polished silver. So um, advantage, so disadvantages, yes, it's hard to mix and match. And another disadvantage that people have said about blackened armor is that when it gets scratched or damaged, um, it shows up more and it's harder to fix up. I don't necessarily agree with that. So my armor has actually been bashed around, uh, you know, scratched and kind of um, sort of used quite a bit. And to be honest, the scratches and scuffs don't really show up. I mean, this helmet has been hit by all sorts of things and look at it. Yeah, okay, it's got, it's got little scratches and squiggles and stuff in it, but by and large, it is still a blackened or blued helmet. <clears throat> it's, um, it's not, you know, it's not, it doesn't look unsightly for having received wear and tear. Moreover, it's not as difficult to fix that as you might think, especially in the modern world, because you can buy tubes of things like perma blue for repairing guns for firearms. So literally you can buy in a tube straight off the internet right now, a tube of paste, and you just, if you've got a big old silver slash down your armor, you can just rub this paste on for the practice on some steel first, although it does vary on the different types of steel, mild steel, carbon steel, it, oxidized at different rates and slightly different colors in my experience, but you rub it a little bit on and when it looks about the right color, quickly wipe it off and put some something like a window cleaner or something on there to, to quickly neutralize it. But fundamentally you can patch up those unsightly bits quite easily. So uh, disadvantages of blue armor. Another one that I've heard is it gets incredibly hot in the sun. Does it? I honestly can't say that that's been my observation. Um, now, it's partly because the material. So if you think about steel, steel is a good conductor of heat and electricity as well. So don't stick your fingers in any plug sockets. Um, but because it's a good conductor of heat, when you're in hot um, environment with the sun beating down on you, whether you're wearing shiny steel or whether you're wearing blackened steel, you're wearing steel. And so the heat from your body uh, will radiate out and the heat from outside will radiate in and it reaches a sort of balance point. Now, is there a difference is there a genuine difference between highly polished steel plate and blackened steel plate? I honestly don't know because I can't say I've done the science, but I have stood in the hottest summer that we've had for ages in this 
uh, at Tewkesbury Battle with other people and a lot of other people keeled over from heat stroke and had to see the medics and all this kind of stuff. And I have to say the people who I thought suffered the most were people in brigandines and people in gambesons and jacks because they're essentially wearing duvets or multiple layers of insulation, whereas me in a cuirass actually had a fairly two-way exchange of heat. Although you get a lot of very sweaty inside, the heat is allowed to radiate in, uh, outwards. Um, better than if you're wearing essentially a body duvet. <laughs> so, um, personally, maybe black armor absorbs a bit more heat from the sun than shiny silver armor does. I haven't, I can't really say for definite. I think that it's probably not the case, or rather that it, you don't notice it, relatively speaking, because it's made of steel and steel doesn't retain heat very well, it, it exudes it, loses heat quite quickly, whereas something like a uh, gambeson retains heat really well. Now, are there any other disadvantages of blackened armor that I can think of? To be honest, not really. Um, one of the only things I could say potentially is it makes you more conspicuous in an environment where most people have got shiny silver armor and maybe you don't want to be noticed on the battlefield, depending on, you know, if some people are out to, to assassinate you or, you know, get a vendetta on you, which in like the Wars of the Roses was quite common. Uh, but honestly, most people, particularly high nobility, focused on making themselves as conspicuous as possible and showing off. So I don't think that would be a thing. Um, it could be that there is a reverse status thing there, that actually in a medieval environment, what showed your greatest wealth was actually having highly polished silvery shiny armor or gilded armor, which was very, very expensive and usually only for sort of very high nobility and kings. Whereas blue armor made you look a bit, maybe a bit middle class. <laughs> Obviously you've got armor, so you're not working class, but you may, you know, maybe, maybe, I don't know. Maybe it didn't look the poshest. That's the, literally the only other thing I can think about as a disadvantage for dark and armor. But overall, um, I can't really think of any big disadvantages for it. It's contrary to my fears of getting it, it's been pretty good. Now let's look at some advantages. So the major advantage of black and armor, and I cannot overstate this point, is it's rust retardants. So this is really good um, at not getting rusty. Now, when you're sweating a lot in armor, it's very hot, sometimes poor people pour water over you. Obviously, if you were actually on a military campaign, you might be wading through a river or riding through a river. You'd have a sweaty horse if you're riding. Horse sweat, not great on armor. Most people, with armor are fighting rust the whole bloody time. Um, and there's a lot of ballistol and WD-40 and mineral oil and Renaissance wax that gets used by people with armor to try and fight off um, that rust. And I have to say, there's a lot of people these days with quite satin finish on their armors. And unfortunately, this is the most prone to rusting because it has the greatest surface area. If you imagine a highly polished surface is very flat but a satin surface is like little serrations. So actually you have an increased surface area and therefore places, nooks and crannies, where moisture is more likely to get trapped and not get oil um, cleaning it out. So satin armor, and I have some satin gauntlets as you know, is more prone to rusting. So highly polished steel, less prone to rusting. But on the flip side between those two, if you get rust on your satin armor, you clean the rust off, you get some wire wool or some wet and dry sandpaper or one of those scrubby pads and you can make it good again really easily. With highly polished armor, if you get rust on it, you clean the rust off and you've now got a big satin spot where you've cleaned the rust off and you have to get it on a buffing wheel and bring it all the way back to mirror polish again. So overall, again, this shows status. If you're rich enough to have high polish on your armor and also rich enough to maintain it and fix it, that means you've got servants, you've got staff, you've got attendants, that shows your wealth. If you've got a satin finish armor, it's obviously cheaper to do in the first place, uh, but it's potentially, although it's more likely to get rusty, it's easier to fix up. So I would say, generally speaking, high polish shows higher status. Now, how does this relate to blued and blacked armor? Well, interestingly, you will notice this is very shiny. Now, this isn't boasting or anything, but this has essentially been mirror polished before it was blued. Now, a lot of blued and blacked armor out there isn't mirror polished before it's blued. It's just satin polished and then blued or blacked. Now, in that case, although the bluing or blacking by itself, because it's oxidized already, and like with ships, you rust a ship's hull to prevent it from getting worse rust later on, then you paint over the rust. Same thing here, if you get a layer of oxidization, it protects it from further oxidization. 
That's why gun barrels and gun parts are blued, incidentally. If you've ever wondered why gun, guns are normally black or blue, that's to uh, protect them from moisture and from rust. Um, so in itself, the bluing or blacking will stave off some rust, but if your surface is satin underneath that, then you're still more likely to get rust than if it's mirror. So the absolute, without using modern stainless steel or without using gilding or tinning, which are other ways of obviously making something rust resistant, the best way of making plain steel rust retardant is mirror polish it, then blue it or black it. Um, and that's what this is. And so this has been, you know, this has been in all sorts of environments, hot and cold. It's been in sweaty training halls and it's I've taught classes, armoured fighting classes, and all kinds of stuff, and it, it has had virtually no rust on it. So the absolute biggest advantage, bluing or blacking, is rust, um, rust fighting, rust combating rust. But I would add to that, it needs to have a mirror polish for full effect. It needs to have a mirror polish underneath the bluing or blacking. So are there any other advantages to bluing or blacking? Well, I, Honestly, I think probably not. It, uh, apart from the fact it just looks really cool. And I think in a world where lots of people have got um, normal, you know, silver coloured armour, steel coloured armour, gilding your armour, bluing your armour, blacking your armour might make you stand out. And I don't think it's an accident that, although I'm sure there were some munition armours which were just blacked straight from the forge, when we look at period artwork, particularly Italian artwork, where it's very clear that there is a darkened or blackened armour, sometimes details are picked out with gilding. So it's very clear that they weren't necessarily just doing the bluing or blacking just for rust retardants and just for, you know, economical whatever reasons, not just, you know, straight from the forge. But because they're going to the effort of gilding rolls and edges and details and stuff on, that shows and that suggests that they're thinking about the overall effect. And everybody knows that gold looks freaking awesome on blue or black. They just, they pop, they absolutely go together. Whereas actually gilding on a silver surface is not so noticeable actually. So I think sometimes it's essentially decorative. Potentially there's also, it might tie in if you wear a, um, if you're armigerous, if, you're if you wear a coat of arms, if it has black as one of the colours in it, that might tie in really well, might make you stand out more, look more impressive. It could also just be fashion. Now, um, black was actually, in clothing, was a relatively expensive colour in, um, in the medieval period. It wasn't very easy to get really dark colours like that necessarily. And so it could just be fashion reasons. It could be at a certain point. For example, we think that quite a lot of blue dharma there was quite a lot of blue armour in Flemish armour in from about 1470 onwards. And so it could just be that in Flanders, in the 1470s, 1480s, there was a fashion for dark armour and people liked the look of it. They just, you know, that's how it works. You know, like the colour of cars, like we'll, we'll go through several years where white cars and red cars are really popular and then they become out of fashion and now it's silver cars and black cars and, you know, everything goes in cycles like this and I suspect it was probably the same with armour as well. So can you think of any other advantages of black armour? For me, it's really about rust retardants and, and that, is no, that is a major, major thing because as I say, people I know who have armour spend so much time fighting, fighting the rust. Uh, and that would have been perhaps even more of a problem in the medieval period where, uh, let's face it, even high status homes and castles and big manor houses were a little bit damp. They weren't as, you know, centrally heated and, and you know, double glazed as modern houses are. So uh, and they weren't stored in plastic boxes like my armour is. They were stored in wooden boxes in relatively damp conditions much of the time, certainly in England. So I don't think that should be understated. And that is, I think, the main reason. I don't think there's, I mean, you could think of silly fantasy reasons like stealth, like fighting at night and things like this. I don't think they're reasons at all. I'm sure Batman would choose armor like this, but honestly, in the 15th century, I can't think of any other major reasons why you'd want blackened armor, uh, apart from uh, rust, one, and probably fashion, two. Um, but if you can think of other reasons, post them down below. Uh, genuinely, I'd be really interested to see actually if you can come up with any really solid good ones. Think of something that really fits in the 15th century. Not a modern reason, like you just like the look of black armour, but, but I mean, that might apply to the 15th century, but if you can tie it into that period, I'd be really, really interested to hear it. Anyway, I'm sure some of you will be um, 
uh, anticipating what my next armor will be. I will keep that secret for now. In due course, you will find out. There are some interesting things to say about the new armor, assuming that it uh, fits okay and everything comes through. And the, um, if it doesn't, I'll probably have this for years. But anyway, at the moment, this is up for sale. The new armor uh, hopefully will be a thing of future videos. And it has this different type of armor, got some different bits to it. So things we can talk about in future videos. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching. I have been Matt Easton. And do you know what? I think I will be next time as well. I hope I'll see you there. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.